The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV. All content in the Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series has been created for informational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this television production. Welcome to our Stay Strong Live Long Education Series on Falls Prevention brought to you by the VON, the Upper Grand Family Health Team and our community partners. I want to start off by saying that falling is the leading cause of injury related death among seniors and the number one contributor to loss of independent living. In fact, one in three seniors 65 years and older will fall each year and falling just once doubles your chance to fall again. It is our hope that through this Whiteman Telecom production that we can change these statistics in Centre Wellington, or in Wellington County actually, empowering our community with the knowledge and tools they need, we need, to prevent future falls. Today's session includes the topic of bone health and osteoporosis. And this is presented to you by Kate Harvey from Osteoporosis Canada. And later in the session, Amy Waugh, our dietitian with the Upper Grand Family Health Team, will also be joining her um, to speak on uh, nutrition aspects related to bone health. Thank you, Julie, and welcome, everyone. So it's difficult to talk about bone health, osteoporosis, and falls and fractures separately. So during today's session and the rest of the series, we hope that you'll find some information that helps to connect all of those things for yourselves. I wanted you to know that the information that I'm going to share today is general in that I am not your physician or your nurse practitioner. So there may be things about you. There could be a, a chronic disease that you have or a medication that you take that would affect some of the information that I'm going to say. So if you're concerned or not sure about that, just take the information that you hear during this series and talk to your primary care provider about it. We hope that today and throughout the entire series that you realize, if you don't already, what an important role that you play in your own healthcare team. You're very important to that team. You certainly experience yourself, including your body, each and every day. And sharing that information with your healthcare providers is very important. Otherwise, they might not know that you're experiencing, as an example, a particular symptom. So be empowered with the information. And here's some good news. Aging is a factor when it comes to our bone health and to osteoporosis, but it does not necessarily mean that you will end up with this chronic disease. There are things that we can do, and today you'll learn about some of those. You'll learn about how to feed your bones uh, properly and in a healthful way, and you'll learn about muscles, and how to uh, move them, how to keep them healthy, and the important role that muscles and bones play. I kind of consider them like really good friends. They work together well and they like to do that. So let's talk about getting to sort of the nitty gritty of bones and bone health. So I don't know if you're aware, but bone is living, growing tissue. So I think that's phenomenal. And I think it's easy to kind of not think of that or to forget about it because most of the times it's all covered up, right? We don't see it, so maybe out of sight, out of mind. So bone is actually a framework of protein. It gets strengthened and hardened by calcium and phosphorus. So because it's living, growing tissue, that's important. It's important to feed that living tissue and to move it safely. So something that's called the remodeling process, and if you take a look at the screen, whether it's because when we're little, we're growing and then our bones are getting bigger, or maybe we've broken our forearm, let's say for example. There are cells in our body that get alerted and they get told, you know what, there's some unhealthy bone there. We can't 
live like that. It leaves us closer to having a broken bone. It's not healthy. So these cells get alerted and they go in and they chew away at that unhealthy part of the bone. So once they create a cavity, all that unhealthy bone is gone. They tell these other cells to come on in. We can't leave a cavity there. The bone is no stronger with a big cavity in it. So those other cells come in and they lay down new bone until that cavity is filled. The bone is then nice and healthy and strong again. So this process is called the remodeling process and happens our entire lifetime. Things change with that remodeling process as we age. Sometimes those cells that come in and chew away at the unhealthy bone, as we age they get a little bit more excited and do too much chewing and don't allow time for the bone building cells to come in and finish that repair. So this information is about falls prevention and we've talked about, you know, being an older adult, but our bone health is important our entire <coughs> lifetime. And I just wanted to say that there's still some folks who think or believe that osteoporosis is strictly an older woman's disease. And that's not the case. Both men and women can get osteoporosis and anyone of any age can get osteoporosis. So I'm saying that because we're talking about peak bone mass. So when we're younger, we need to run and jump and play and have fun. We need to eat a, a nice calcium rich diet, get a good amount of vitamin D so that we can build up to our peak bone mass. We do that and we get to our peak bone mass about the age of 20. And then we hold on to that level of bone until about the age of 30. And just naturally, a natural part of aging, even at 30, 30 so young, but we'll start to slowly lose some of that bone mass. <coughs> All things being equal, and by that I mean there's not another disease that the person has or something else that might affect that bone level. That's really a slow, gradual bone loss, and it's not an issue typically. For women, when they reach menopausal years, the amount of bone loss that they achieve or start to experience is far greater. It gets more rapid, mostly because of estrogen. There's a change in that hormonal level. So that can pose a problem. That can mean that there's more bone that's being lost and the person, the woman in this case, needs to realize that and how else can I help my body to maintain the bone that I have? Same thing will happen for men, but typically you won't see that until you're about the age of 65. So there is a hormonal change for men as well, just a little bit later in life. So if you look at the screen again, there's two examples there. On the left-hand side of the screen, you will see that's a picture of normal bone. It's nice and dense and healthy. The other side of the screen is what bone that has osteoporosis looks like. So you might be thinking, Kate, there are holes in both of those examples. And that's very true. There's an outer, sort of denser, a thicker um, element of bone on the outside part of our bone, called cortical bone. But on the inside, particular of our long bones, our spine, thigh, and arms, there is like a honeycomb sort of structure, that crisscross sort of structure that you can see on the screen. So when it's nice and dense and healthy bone, it will look like the left-hand side. Those holes are part of that amazing, strong, healthy structure. But if you look at the right-hand side, look at the size of the holes. Look at some of the pieces of the bone that you see there, very narrow. The problem with that is if you trip and have a fall and your bone looks like the right-hand side of the screen, you are closer to breaking the bone. And when I say a fracture or broken bone, I mean the same thing. So that's the issue with our bones getting less dense and not quite as healthy. So there's something that's called a fragility fracture or a low trauma fracture. If any of us from standing height or less, so that could mean that uh, somebody's walking across a room or down a sidewalk, they maybe slip out of a chair or roll out of the bed. 
even though we hit the surface very hard, it's very jarring, it's startling, even though we do that, if our bones are nice and dense and healthy, we should not break them. So if we do, from something simple like that, even though it doesn't feel simple at the time, it's a, it's a nasty thing to fall, our bones are made to withstand that sort of fall. Now the other thing that I wanted to say is that sometimes when people have fragile or less dense bones or osteoporosis, there can be sort of spontaneous broken bones. And that can happen with an example might be somebody has a nasty cold and they start a sort of a coughing uh, fit or something like that. That sort of pressure can also cause a bone to break when they're fragile. You know, lifting a heavy bag of groceries could cause a bone to break. So from falling is very key, but also if you have uh, fragile bones, then some of those what we call spontaneous fractures can occur also. I just wanted to tell you that these fragility fractures, it does not relate to something that we would call high trauma. So somebody that's a downhill skier and they break a bone or in a motor vehicle accident and they break a bone, that's a different kind of broken bone. And osteoporosis does not relate to our knees, to the bones in our hands and our feet and our face and skull. There's so many small bones in those parts of our body that it could be anybody might break them under any sort of situation. So it's really the long bones, you know, our shoulders, our, our arms, our legs, our back and our hips. So one in three women and one in five men in Canada, 50 years of age or over, will experience a broken bone caused by osteoporosis in their lifetime. So it's a big number, especially with baby boomers, right? So I'm one of them. So I am, may, I hope not, but I may contribute to this, right? Just because I'm, I'm growing older. The number of broken bones in Canada, the total number, outweigh the number of heart attacks, stroke, and breast cancer combined. So all equally important um, diseases or conditions or experiences, but we tell people that just so that you're aware that there are a lot of broken bones caused by osteoporosis. So why do we care? What's, what's the big deal? People break their bones all the time, they fall all the time. So there are severe consequences. Uh, it could mean that the person has to be hospitalized. It could be if we think of somebody that's living in their own home, maybe they live alone, they experience a hip fracture, so break their hip, maybe because of pain or because of just doing the regular things they do all day long, did it before the broken hip all on their own, but now that hip fracture keeps them from doing some of those things, they may need to go into an institution like a long-term care facility. Nothing wrong with long-term care facility, but maybe that person was not ready for that. They just didn't see that coming at that point in their life. Death can be a part of this situation. It's not really so much that osteoporosis has caused the death, but once the fracture or the broken bone happens, sometimes people get a little fearful. Let's say they broke the bone from a fall. They might start thinking, boy, that happened last winter. I slipped on some ice, I fell and I broke my hip, and my life was changed forever. So this winter is coming up, it'll be here before we know it. That person may be just thinking, I'm not gonna go out and play bridge this year because that's when I was going, that's when I fell and broke my hip. So then, you can see why people would be fearful, but they might stay at home more. So then it could be they're not exercising quite the same. So then they're a little bit more deconditioned. It could be that staying at home means that they're not getting out and having fun with their friends. So that can be isolating, right? I think we've all probably heard recently that social isolation is not a good health issue. So all sorts of things can kind of decondition us, this entire package, our mind and our spirit and our body, and could lead to more fractures, or just not as happy a life. So decrease in quality of life is really important, and that fear of falling. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of fractures that are, are key. Um, hip fractures, 
are very important. Uh, life can change quite a bit when a person experiences a hip fracture. About 28% of women in uh, Canada and 37% of men in Canada will experience a, a, a hip fracture caused by osteoporosis. And there's lots of complications associated with that. Before I go to um, something else that I wanted to tell you, I wanted to say too, I mentioned that hips, and then I didn't quite yet say, but the other um, broken bone area that I wanted to tell you about that is key is the spine. But if you think of a wrist fracture caused by osteoporosis, sometimes those are the fractures that alert us to something's not right with their with the person's bone health. So they're like a signal fracture. So even though I said hip and spines are key, sometimes a risk fracture, fracture gives us a great deal of information. So spine fractures, why are they important? Why is this important to falls prevention? If you look at the screen again, the skeleton on the left-hand side is a nice healthy skeleton. It's got nice upright posture. There's a natural curve in the spine. If you look from the side, which that's the direction it shows them from, the ear and the shoulder and the hip and the ankle kind of are a nice alignment. So that's a nice healthy structure. With our spine, sometimes what can happen when it's a bone health issue is that vertebrae are typically nice and level. And there can be a compression fracture for a person that has low uh, bone mass. And what happens is that vertebrae becomes more like a wedge shape. So instead of having that nice upright posture like the skeleton on the left hand side, you can't help it. Just structurally you'll start to bend forward, to curve forward. So what's the problem with that? The problem is a few things. We are sturdiest and further away from a fall when we have nice upright posture, just like that left hand skeleton there. When we start to curve over, we're more susceptible to a fall. And if we're more susceptible to a fall and we have low bone mass, we're closer to breaking a bone. And you can see the third um, skeleton there. That skeleton actually has lost and broken, lost bone and broken a number of vertebrae, so much so that that lower um, rib is now resting on their hip. That can be very painful. Uh, it can mean that all of those major organs in the middle part of our body are kind of being squished almost all the time. If you think of, if you, you don't have to do it here, but if you want to, you certainly can. If you think of just bending your knees a bit and then coming forward, think of breathing all day long like that in that position. I, I can tell just from the short period of time that I bent over like that, that my lungs aren't getting the opportunity to fill up and provide me with the nice amount of fresh air that I need. So lots of issues like that, and like I mentioned earlier, it can mean that the person is unsteady on their feet and may fall over and fracture or break their bone. So I mentioned earlier that osteoporosis can be experienced by men and women. So we just want to make sure that we're not forgetting about anybody. So I wanted to talk about men and osteoporosis just a little bit. Um, there's a lack of awareness that men can experience bone loss and actually uh, have osteoporosis. So we need to keep educating ourselves. So you folks are doing a wonderful job by being part of this series. We're going to try together to get the word out there and let folks know that this is not just strictly a woman's disease. And the other thing is that, and we're working on it, you know, uh, researchers and uh, pharmacists, everybody is working on trying to develop some new treatments that actually work for men. So things are changing, but we all need to do our part. So you re may remember, um, Years ago, we used to talk about BMDs, which are bone mineral densities. So we still talk about them, but that was pretty much the only thing we talked about when trying to decide or diagnose if somebody actually had osteoporosis. But now we know better. Now we know that there are other factors that we need to consider. A bone mineral density test is still the gold standard test to take a look at the bones to see are they dense enough or not. So we still need to use this tool. 
if you have reached the age of 65 and haven't yet had one, it's a really good idea to talk to your primary care provider about being referred to get one. So I know in Centre and Northern Wellington there are a few options to access bone mineral density tests. Uh, wait lists are not that long that I'm aware of. And if you're uh, into politics or concerned about health care costs, this test is actually one of the, the least expensive health care tests to have administered. So that's a good thing too. What's really wonderful about it is that it is, does not take much time to actually have. You don't have to take a medication. You don't have to be injected with a dye. Most of the sites that run the machine, you can leave your clothes on so you're nice and comfortable. On the screen is an example of a bone mineral density test machine. Person just lays on them, their back down. You may have to put a wedge or a pillow between your ankles and then at another position, maybe under your knees. That's just so that the technologist can really place you well on the machine so they get a really good picture for the radiologist to look at and diagnose and evaluate afterwards. It maybe takes 10 minutes. It is x-ray, but it's very low dose x-ray, so that's another plus. There may be younger people who need to have a bone mineral density test, so people under 65 years of age. So you know how we've mentioned the Navy's going to, in just a few minutes, give you lots of information of how to feed your bones well. There may be conditions where people are eating a really good diet, doing everything they can to feed their, their bones well and keep their entire uh, body nice and health healthy, but they may have a condition like celiacs. So they just don't absorb the nutrients as efficiently as if they didn't have that disease. So some of those folks may be under 65 years of age and they can have a bone mineral density test done. So if you haven't had one done, at least have the conversation with your, your physician or your nurse practitioner. So we take the bone mineral density test, there's a number that comes with it. Your primary care provider will take a look at that and then they'll take other things in consideration. Are they a man or a woman? Have they had other things like maybe their mom had a hip fracture? Maybe their mom and dad had a hip fracture. Do they currently smoke? Do they currently drink a number of alcoholic beverages every day? All of those things are risk factors. So they'll take all of that into consideration. And all of us would come into either low, moderate, or high risk. And high risk for what? High risk for a broken bone. So that's what's important about osteoporosis. You probably could live pretty well with osteoporosis. The real challenge is that you may end up with a broken bone. And that's why falls are so important. More important, preventing the falls so that you don't have that broken bone. Unless osteoporosis is diagnosed, people do not know that they have this condition. It's that broken bone that actually tells people that I've got osteoporosis. So let's get out there and do the best we can and prevent all of that. So your family physician will take all of the information, the BMD number from the test, all of the other information I uh, mentioned just a, a minute ago, and they'll see if you come in at low, moderate, or high risk for an additional fracture. If you're at low risk, you're doing wonderful. So it's great, keep on doing what you're doing. If you're at high risk, we know that you're at high risk for breaking a bone or breaking another bone, depending on whether it's your first low trauma fracture or a subsequent one. We know that even though people don't want to take medication, I am in that group of people, um, we know that the help that those medications provide in preventing additional fractures far outweigh any of the potential side effects. But I know people are concerned about that, so please ask your questions. Ask your questions of your primary care provider. Ask your questions of your pharmacist, your registered dietitian and get all of your answers so that you feel comfortable. It's the moderate risk group of people for a subsequent fracture that really it's a clinical judgment. So here's an example. Somebody has their BMD done, their bone mineral density test done, and they're found to be at moderate risk for another fracture. 
maybe when they're sitting down and talking with their family physician, it comes to light that the person didn't realize that they needed to take vitamin D for their bones. And Amy will talk more about that. So it could be the decision is, okay, take this amount of vitamin D every day for a year and then we'll run that test again and we'll see what the result is. So some people at moderate risk may go on to treatment or medication and some may not. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you thought BMD results, age, sex, previous fragility, fracture, and other risk factors. Right. What about hip replacements? Not if it's just a, strictly a replacement, no. It would have to be related to a broken bone. So sometimes it's wear and tear for a hip replacement. Sure. Yeah. But wear and tear then is, is almost the basis for a lot of fractures too, other than falls. It, uh, it could be, but in this case, no, we don't consider that. You don't consider that. That's right. Statistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just for you bring up a really great question, and thank you for that. People who have had a hip fracture, a spine fracture, two or more of those fragility fracture, that alone we know that they're at high risk for another fracture. So those folks need to, to really go on to some kind of treatment. So just a few items about things that you can uh, and should avoid if you either suspect or know that you have low bone mass or, or osteoporosis. Bouncy, jerky, twisty movements. And you'll hear more about physical activity in this, uh, this entire series. That can put your bones at a compromised position. Make sure you wear good footwear. It fits well. It's good tread. It's comfortable and be attentive when you move around. So take a look at, I know I think you've heard it probably the very first session of this series about how to look at your home and make sure it's safe and when you're out and about, you know, looking for cracks in sidewalks, that sort of thing. Be as safe as you can. So I don't know if we have any additional questions now. We can only all just do our best, right? So my feeling is if during each one of these sessions so we can pick one piece of information that makes better sense to us or perhaps it's something we didn't know before and then we can implement it into our life that that's a good thing so don't uh, sometimes it can be overwhelming you hear a lot of information so maybe don't get stressed if you can help it by that just think of think things over have a good discussion with different members of your healthcare team and pick what fits for you and what you're able to do at this time I have one other question. Sure. Uh, and it deals with the neck. Okay. So as people age, there's a deterioration between the discs. Mm -hmm. They come down, head comes down, and it's probably the reason I fell in was so, so short, the third fell in there. Oh, right. Because of that deterioration. Now, does that uh, increase the potential for the fractures in your back or your neck or whatever by having that deterioration and, and bone on bone? So that particular question I cannot answer. I would consult with your primary care provider about that particular, about that degeneration in your neck. What I can tell you is when we think of our spine and think of osteoporosis, the cervical part of the spine or that neck part, we don't consider that that would be osteoporosis type of, yeah. So there, it could play a role, but as far as bone health, I'm not aware of that for your question, but it wouldn't be osteoporosis bone in that part of your spine. I, I wonder too, with, with Warren's earlier question about the hip, I wonder Warren, were you thinking of osteoarthritis as the reason behind the hip replacement? No, but I, I think... Sometimes it, just those two words, the osteoporosis yeah. and osteoarthritis... Can be confusing. Can, can, yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's many reasons for, for hip replacements. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, probably it's more wear and tear. I think you're right. That, that causes that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, whether arthritis is set in or whether rheumatism is set in or right. whatever... Um, the pain becomes unbearable and it's uh, affected and ultimately you have a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not too sure if that then leads to fractures or whatever. Uh, 
I mean, it's it is a problem to get around, and it is painful, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that would be the difference, maybe, too, of an elective surgery. So you plan for that surgery because the pain is so severe right. that you plan and anticipate a hip surgery. Whereas with osteoporosis, it's often the fracture, fracture. that right. leads to then an emergency yes. surgery, yeah. and that's why it's all, all almost often so traumatic in someone's life because yeah. they weren't planning and anticipating this happening yeah. and disrupting their flow of life. That's right. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's right. So if this is helpful, when you think of osteoarthritis and osteoporosis, and it is a confusing, they're so similar, it's that osteo. So osteoarthritis is all of the material, all of the things around our joints that it's related to. Osteoporosis is strictly the bone. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. Excuse yeah, me. <clears throat> Great. So. I think that now I can introduce my colleague and friend, Amy, registered dietitian here at the Upper Grand Family Health Team. Thanks, everyone. So thanks, Kate, for, for that uh, forward into this next discussion around the nutrition that can contribute to our bone health as well. So as Kate said, this bone density loss is, is a rather inevitable process of as we age, as we have more birthdays, that bone density is starting to, to diminish. And from a nutritional standpoint, we also have some changes going on that we can, we can address as well. And I think what's changed a little bit too in the last few years around the nutrition and bone health is that it's not about necessarily increasing our bone density, but how can we slow the loss so that we can not lose as much and slow that process down. So I don't want people to think that all of a sudden we can start building denser bones by changing the way we eat or taking your calcium supplements, but all these strategies are designed to slow down how fast we're losing our bone mass to try to preserve as much of it as possible. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the vitamins and the minerals that are involved in, in bone health. Some of the other things that we do in a typical Canadian diet that also interfere with calcium absorption and, and bone loss of uh, our bones kind of sucking some calcium back out on us. We'll talk about whether or not supplements are a good thing or necessary or not necessary and some of the things that we can kind of do from a food standpoint to, um, to keep our bones healthy. There is definitely some things that we do in our Canadian typical diet that, that can have an impact on calcium and how much we need and how much, how much our bones uh, pull out to, to use. Most of the calcium we have in our body is stored in our bones. So 99%, it's like the bank deposit for calcium is our bones. The other 1% is circulating all the time in our bloodstream and we need it for heart regulation, for muscle control, for hormone regulation. We need that calcium out and about for a lot of different things. If we don't get enough from our diet though, day to day, your, bone, your body will go to the bones and say, come on bones, give me some calcium. Amy didn't eat enough today, so we've got to get that back out in the bloodstream. So if day after day after day after day you don't have enough calcium or vitamin D in your diet, your bones will be pulling calcium much more rapidly than they would otherwise because your body still requires that little 1% every day to function. So some of the things that we, we do is we also don't get enough vitamin D for the most part in Canada, so we'll talk about vitamin D. And some of us get a little too much protein, some of us might get a little too little protein and though that can have an impact on our calcium balance as well and our, and our bone health. And a little bit we'll talk about just our own body weights. So people who tend to be uh, small, slight, um, low body weight individuals have less bone density than those of us that are carrying extra weight. So it's one place in the world where carrying a few extra pounds around the middle actually is a good thing. Helps our, your, your bones have to work a lot harder. So we'll talk about um, Canada's food guide, healthy eating, where do we get calcium from, where do we get vitamin D from. Canada's food guide is available, I don't talk about it too much in this session, there's a, a subsequent session where I go into a lot more detail about this. But this is a great guide, just to go look for that, whether it's your doctor's office, public health unit, pharmacies sometimes have them too, you can order it online. Um, and it's online it, itself at the Health Canada website. But that's kind of my reference for, for the talking that we'll do today. Calcium, anybody know how much calcium we need every day? Guesses. <laughs> 
about a thousand, I was say a thousand. thousand, about a thousand to twelve hundred, depending on our age. Okay, so you'll see on the screen there is a slide up there. Under fifty, a thousand, over fifty, we should be aiming for about twelve hundred milligrams, and that was um, decreased from fifteen hundred. So there may be some of you that have in your head still have. I need 1,500 milligrams of calcium every day. About six years ago, that, that guideline was revised, and we've lowered it. Just based on what we know about the health risks of overdoing calcium, there are some risks associated with that, particularly like kidney stones, some cardiovascular outcomes. So we can get too much from supplements. We don't worry too much about getting too much from food, but we do worry about people taking too much from a supplement. So those guidelines were um, decreased to that 1,200. So what would that look like? That would kind of look like lots of different foods that we can get calcium from. We tend to think about dairy, so our milk, yogurts, cottage cheeses, those are all good sources for sure. Um, almonds, good source. Okay? It doesn't need to be dairy. So dairy is a great source because there's so much calcium in a, in a serving of dairy. But you can get calcium from lots of different places. Okay, so nuts, almonds are a good source. Soybeans, soy nuts. Anybody, if they're fresh, they're called edamame, the green soy nuts. But you can buy them roasted too, and those are a great snack to have. Um, a lot of our dried fruit, figs in particular, but all the dried fruit, apricots, prunes, those things have some good calcium in them as well. This little jar in here is, is, is I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but they're chia seeds. Okay, sesame seeds too have tons and tons of calcium in them. So it's thinking about all the things that we kind of do. We should try to aim for a good three servings, if you can, of the dairy foods. So whether it's cheese, yogurt, milk. You can also get it from the soya department, almond milks, soy milks, nut milks. Those all are fortified with some calcium as well. Of trying to get some a focus on some of those with every meal, right? That there's something every time you kind of sit down to eat that might be a calcium source for you that's fairly intentional. Okay. So we kind of did that. Anybody got ideas of things, it's like you're cheating a little bit, that, that might cause you to be losing calcium faster than you might want to? Any ideas? Salt. Salt, yeah. Salt's one for sure, okay? Alcohol. That's a factor. Caffeine is another one that sometimes people will ask me about. Is I've heard if I drink too much coffee, I'm going to be losing calcium from my bones. Um, and protein, animal protein in particular. Okay, so thinking about things like meats, not so much fish, um, but thinking about our red meat, four-legged animal meat, that can have an impact on calcium balance too. What we kind of have come to know in the last couple of years is that most of those things are, are not terribly significant. You don't need to worry too much. I will say probably the salt's the, probably the biggest factor in Canada because most of us get twice as much salt as we need in our day. So the more salt we need, your body tends to neutralize that by, by pulling calcium from the bones. Okay? And the animal protein to a lesser extent, but you know, it's not quite as significant as people used to think. We used to hear a lot about pop too. Is pop phosphorus in pop? Is that bad for my bones? And we kind of believe that that's not the phosphorus in the pop, but it's the drinking of the pop rather than drinking of the milk. That's the problem. So it's not that the pop itself causes bone damage, but if you're displacing some of those other foods with pop, then you're not going to be getting as much calcium as you, sh as you need. So if you're just a big drinker, tons of salt, and you're a big meat eater, you might kind of really want to emphasize, you know, that you are getting a lot of calcium from some other places because your body might need a little bit, a little bit more. But generally speaking, I would say most of us, you don't need to think and worry too much about that, that piece. Okay. Well, I had salt and I quit it. Quit it. I only had one when I was in something, but I don't had it or anything. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. a little comment about that salts. And most of us are more aware. I think the message has gotten out of how much salt is in a lot of the foods that we consume mm -hmm. and, and how little we actually need. We don't really have to focus on, on looking for salt. We will get, we'll get it. And particularly things like this, right? Like the chocolate flavored milk, whether it's chocolate milk or vanilla almond or the soy milks that are sweetened. Repeat the comment. 
comment. Sorry. Yes, the comment was around how much sugar is in some milk, right? In yogurt. Mm -hmm. In yogurts for I sure. Know, yes. Yep, yep. So natural milk's got a bit of sugar, but you're right, the flavored stuff, twice, three times, four times, sometimes the amount of sugar is in the, in the, the plain versions. So as much as possible in terms of sugar, and many of us are watching different things, right? We're watching our sugar for diabetes, we're watching fat for heart disease, we're watching a lot of different things. So that was a great comment to, um, to keep in mind. So just in terms of things you can do to increase your calcium in your diet, we'll be thinking about, you know, do I throw some almonds on my salad? Do I have some yogurt for a snack instead of a handful of crackers? Could I throw some sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, chia seeds, any of the seeds high in calcium, throw them into something, right? Flax seeds in your oatmeal. You could throw nuts, dried fruit in your oatmeal. So just be consciously trying to think. The other place that we get lots of calcium from would be this little section, green leafy veggies. Tons of calcium, right? Particularly in this little guy, this, bok, this is bok choy, this is a miniature one, <laughs> but they're often twice the size. A tremendous amount, right? It's about two thirds the amount of, is in the same amount of milk as in this greeny thing. So that's pretty significant, okay? It's, it's very yeah, and amazing. Again, cook it, you can eat it raw, you can cook it, stir fry it quick, chop it up, just throw it in a salad, and it's available everywhere, it's pretty cheap, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Um, like I sometimes they're twice the size, and these are the little baby ones, but chop them up. Mm -hmm. Broccoli, a little bit less than in the, the bok choy, but broccoli, again, you're going to get about 100 milligrams of calcium in a, in a cup of that. Kale is another one. Anybody do kale? <laughs> Kale is a, it's a wonderful green leafy uh, veggie and it lasts forever in your fridge. Unlike lettuce and spinach and some of the other greens, this will last for a good week or two in your fridge. So chop it up real fine. It's tough. It's a little tough. But chop it up. You can throw again, throw it and add it to a salad, throw it on top of a pizza, throw it in your soup. Okay, lots of, <laughs> lots of good things you could do with that to get a, to get so a bit of calcium. calcium no, not yeah. lettuce. No. So the question is, is lettuce a good calcium source? It's not green, so it's much. Green. It's green, yeah. it's green, it's not quite as green as these things. Okay. So it might be a place, right, if you're used to just doing plain old lettuce, that might be your thing of just trying to add a, new, a different thing. I with your lettuce, cheese. yep, that's great. And cheese, right, yeah. shredded cheese on a salad, oh, great yeah, way. So just keep in mind, right, there, that there's other places to get calcium. We tend to think milk, and milk's a great go-to because it is, got a ton in it and not very much, but we get calcium from all kinds of places too. So just to kind of think about that, almonds in particular in the nut family, they're the highest ones. All nuts have a little bit. Okay. Fish is another place, so canned fish. If you eat the bones in the salmon, right, the calcium's in the bones. But a can of salmon with the bones in it, as much calcium as in the glass of milk. What right? about tuna? Okay. It wouldn't have the bones. So the question was, what about tuna? Right? I don't eat salmon, so mm -hmm. I eat tuna out of can. Calcium is in the bones. Okay, so traditional, again, traditional communities in our north, northern Canada, for example, never had osteoporosis until their diet sort of shifted to be a lot more processed like their southern neighbors um, of what we're doing because they eat all the bones of their fish they eat. They tend to use the bones. So it's in the bones, okay? Calcium's in the bones of the salmon. It's not in the meat of the fish, okay? So you may be thinking, do I need a calcium supplement? You may also be someone who is still taking 1,500 milligrams of calcium as a supplement because 10 years ago or 20 years ago, that was the wisdom. Everybody was taking 1,500 milligrams of calcium. There is a, web, uh, a calcium calculator on the Osteoporosis Canada website where you can look up foods and see how much calcium you get in your day. You can look on labels of things to see how much you get. And I always tell people when you want to kind of figure that out, assume you get 300 just across the board because calcium is in everything. It's in bread, it's in fruit, it's in veggies, it's in every food we eat we'll have a little bit. So assume you get 300 and then try to get an extra two or three of some of these foods that are fairly rich in calcium. Okay, whether it's your almonds or your bok choy or the dairy products, 
And you'll probably be a lot closer to that 1,000 to 1,200 than you think. And you might not need to take as much as a supplement as you may find that you're already doing. Okay. Look at your multivitamins. The multivitamins will all have calcium in them as well. So you might be getting some there that you hadn't really calculated into the picture. We don't want people to take more than 1,200. Whether it's food or supplement or food and supplement together, no more than 1,200. You may have been told to take more if you're seeing a specialist for something in particular, as Kate alluded to in the earlier session. There may be some situations where you have been told to take more and, and that's something that you just chat about with your specialist. But generally speaking, even with osteoporosis, no more than 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. So where does that 1,200 come from? Ideally, it comes mostly from food. Yeah, okay. Okay, because we know that that's a better place to get it from. Our body responds a lot better to calcium as it trickles in slowly. And from food, it takes your body usually a few hours, right, to access that sure. calcium. When you take it as a supplement, your body gets a fairly quick jolt of calcium into your bloodstream. And that's what's probably problematic about taking too much calcium in a supplement is the, the load that hits your, your bloodstream so fast. But if you do feel like you need a supplement, we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a second. Well, we can go into that right now. Because the supplements come in every formulation, right? It's like going into the candy store. The whole wall is full of calcium supplements. And you can find, um, and I'm not purporting any particular brand. This is calcium citrate, okay? There's calcium carbonate. There's calcium with vitamin D. There's calcium with magnesium in it, okay? This one's got magnesium. And there will be 250 milligrams of calcium up to, I've got one that's got, there's 1,500 milligrams of calcium in the one chewable thing. So we would suggest that you don't ever take more than 500 as a supplement at one time, even from food. Okay, so if you were to take, you know, two glasses full of milk at one meal, your body is really only going to use the calcium out of that one glass. The other one is just going to kind of get lost your body can't absorb it that fast. But if you do need a supplement, calcium carbonate is the cheapest and you do need to take it with food. Mm -hmm. Calcium citrate you can take at any time of the day. It doesn't need to be taken with food. If you're on antacids for um, reflux or ulcers or you take Tums all the time, you may want to take the citrate version because the other one needs that stomach acid to really um, become absorbed better. Most of them, some of them came with vitamin D in them as well. Okay, so I would suggest though that you take your, we'll talk about vitamin D in a second, but just take calcium by itself. It's very difficult to get enough D without going overboard in the calcium, okay, and when they're combined, because they most, most of them don't have enough vitamin D. There are chewable versions, there are like, dissolvable ones, there's powder, there's liquids, there's pills. There are ones that you can chew and there's ones you gotta swallow. So you kinda wanna take a lot of those things into consideration. Some people have um, difficulty with digestion too. Calcium supplements can be tough on the stomach in terms of bloating, constipation, stomach aches. So again, the citrate formulation is sometimes goes over better in that situation if you find you need one. But the challenge would be just to don't assume you need one because I think a lot of us are in the mindset that we need one. You may not need one if you kind of go through your day and do a little bit of a tally and just see where you're at with that piece. And most of us, if you do need one, you probably only need, you know, three to 500. You don't need the whole thousand. So I think it's worth a discussion with your physician um, because these guidelines, they have shifted just in the last few years. There's been a, a real change in the way we're um, approaching calcium so supplements. Calcium, just put me on, me calcium. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Vitamin D, this is our, our next little topic. Quickly, we'll do vitamin D. Vitamin D is a, the only nutrient that we really do not get from food. We can only get it from sun. the sun. Right? The sun is where we get vitamin D. Health Canada recommends everybody across the board, adults get about 1,000 uh, international units a day. And for the osteoporosis guidelines are also in that same vein, right? If we're over 50, 800 up to 2,000. Okay, so we do not get it from food except fish. So go back to fish. And this time you don't have to eat the bones. 
I use a I you just have to eat the flesh of the fish, and that's t and, and it's in the fattier fish, right? So salmon, herring, the f mackerel, tuna has some for sure, but the fattier the fish, the, the more vitamin D you're gonna you're gonna get, and you get about five half your vitamin D you would actually get from just this much fish a day, but you have to eat fish at least twice a day every day all year long. What about tuna in the Tuna in a can will have some vitamin D as well. Right. So whatever fish it is, there will be some vitamin D in there. But that's about it. Okay. Milk has a little bit added to it. Our margarine in Canada has a little bit of vitamin D added to it as well. But there's like 25, right, in a teaspoon. And we're trying to get to 1,000. So you don't want to rely on margarine. <laughs> and most of us... <laughs> Most of us aren't drinking 10 cups of milk every day either, right? So vitamin D, you need to take it as a supplement. Need to take it as a supplement. It's also the only supplement that we can take it all at once, once a week. You can take it three times a week. You don't need to take the same amount every single day. You could save it all up your thousand and take 7,000 on Sunday night if you want, right? If it's easier to remember. We store it. So as long as you keep getting a dose in of that 1,000 up to two a day, that's a good guideline, and you do need to take it as a supplement. Yeah, take it any time of day. Doesn't matter if you take it in the morning. Doesn't matter if you take it with food. Doesn't matter. So if, if you're a sun worshiper, mm -hmm. how much vitamin D are you taking in? Right. So that's a great question about whether or not if we're still sun worshiping are we going to get enough vitamin D? And historically we did, right? That we were outside, nobody had sunscreen, we didn't wear hats. We got all the vitamin D we needed from that kind of May to August and that would be enough to last us for the whole year. Today that's not the case. If you are a sun worshiper though, 20 minutes a day, you can kind of make what you need for that period of time. But you'd have to be out a lot longer to get enough to store for the whole year. And in terms of this skin cancer guidelines, that's not a suggestion that we're, we want to make to people. <laughs> so you could, you could. <laughs> not great for the skin cancer department. So hence the, the supplement is, is, is the words of advice. But you can, 20 minutes a day, with your arms exposed, you can make enough, right, for summer. So some people will just take the supplement from September to, to April, and then in the summertime they quit. The problem is that we often forget to start it back up again in the fall. And there's no harm in taking it all year long, irregardless if you're in the sun, all the merrier, you'll store that extra. But basically we, we suggest you just take it all, every day, all year round, yeah. and you'll get it. That's a good question. So you do need it. Okay. So just, I hope you got a little bit of a sense of just the, the nutrients important for bone health. And the focus today was really the protein, the calcium, vitamin D, lots of other minerals though involved in, in bone health. And just to kind of review the food guide, get a sense of portions, try to think about, you know, have I got any of these things in front of me? The greens, the nuts, the seeds, the dairy. Have I got that kind of on the go every day? And if so, you're probably pretty close to getting what you need. But it does take a bit of thinking a lot of people don't get enough calcium or vitamin D if you're not taking a supplement. So hopefully you learned something today and got, got some strategies. I, I have a question for you dealing with salt. Mm -hmm. Sea salt versus the, the old yep. white box. Winter, yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, pros and cons. So pros and cons, in terms of blood pressure, in terms of the stiffening of the arteries that happens when we eat a salt load, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Yeah. Um, the iodine, this has got iodine added to it, which yeah. in our region of the world, we're, our soil is very deplete of iodine, which we believe is kind of contributing a bit to the thyroid issue, everyone's hypothyroid. So that's a bit of a factor to use the processed salt if you really need it. But the sea salt's got lots of great minerals in it too, right? And sometimes more flavor. So you can get away with less mm -hmm. of it than sometimes the other one. Um, so I'm kind of neither here, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. In terms of blood pressure, it doesn't matter where the salt comes from. It's all going to affect that piece regardless. Like what about onion salt and garlic salt? And, you know, like, I yeah. Know, I was probably, 
but yep. those? So they're still salt. Oh, they're mostly salt with a little bit of flavor. Okay, I don't yep. Three years of salt. Yep. But you can get plain just onion powder and garlic powder, and those have the exact same flavor, but without the salt. And salt's a really learned taste, right? When we weren't born really loving the taste of salt, we learn to like it, and we've got a really powerful primal brain that is telling us to go find salt everywhere. But the more we have, the more you want. And it kind of ups the... So raw onions mm -hmm. or raw garlic, good or bad? I don't think there's anything bad with them. Yeah. No. What are you thinking about? Well, no. I mean, I, I have an addiction for onions. Well, you go for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and my daughter will tell you that. And I have a, a I love garlic. I'm my, but is that is that classified in the salt? No, not at no. all. No, so not at raw, all. The raw stuff. The raw stuff is fine. Great. It's the garlic and onion salts are really salt with a yeah. little bit of something in them. Yeah, no, no, right. Good. Yep. No, and in terms of cancer prevention, that family of foods is is powerful. Yeah. It's the there's sulfur in those things. It's yeah. very potent antioxidant. Thank you very much, Amy and Kate, for that amazing presentation. We hope you guys at home found this information valuable and helpful. If you require any further information about Osteoporosis Canada or where to find free exercise classes in your community, stay tuned to the end of the presentation and the contact information will be displayed on the screen. Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we do. It takes an entire community to prevent a fall. Thank you. For more information about the free, smart, gentle exercise programs in your area, check out the Vaughn Smart website at www.vonsmartexercise.com or contact Smart Program Coordinator Kelly G by phone 519-323-2330 extension 4954 or by email at kelly.gee at von.ca The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.